Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and today, let's talk polarizers. So many of the filters we used to carry as film photographers have been, thankfully, replaced by the digital darkroom. No more warming or cooling filters, no more filters for fluorescent light. Heck, I don't even use split grads anymore. I can do just about everything right from Photoshop. However, there is one filter in my bag that just can't be replaced, and that's this one right here, the polarizer. A polarizer is a little different than most of the filters you've seen before. It's basically a couple pieces of glass sandwiched together with the front one allowing for rotation. We'll talk about some tricks for using that filter here in a few minutes, so just stay tuned. First, let's clear up one of the biggest misconceptions about polarizers, and that is that it's only used to make blue skies bluer. Well, that's certainly a valid use for it. It really misses the bigger reason to use a polarizer, and that's to eliminate reflections. Now, as nature photographers, it's easy to kind of dismiss this use. After all, when you look around, it doesn't seem like there's that much of a problem with reflections in the natural world. However, just about every wet rock, piece of vegetation, and water source you come across usually has some degree of reflection to it. And a polarizer allows you to eliminate, or at least control it, on pretty much any non-metallic surface. When people first hear this, they usually grossly underestimate the amount of reflection on natural objects. After all, you know, how much reflection can a leaf possibly have, right? Well, it turns out quite a bit. The problem is, while each individual leaf shows only a little reflection, when taken as a whole, it robs you of a ton of rich, saturated color you would have otherwise had in your photo. Just remember the last time you were traveling down a road lined with colorful trees in the fall and you had your polarized sunglasses on, and then you took them off. The difference was pretty incredible, wasn't it? A polarizer could do the same thing for your images. Now, another common question that gets asked is why can't this just be done afterwards in Photoshop like so many of the other filters we used to use in the past? The trick here is that when a polarizer takes the reflection off of an object, it reveals details that would not have been visible without it. So if the detail is invisible, well, you can't record it with a camera sensor. The bottom line is that when you take a shot without a polarizer, you grab the reflection. You didn't record the information under it. So there's no way to fix it afterwards. Of course, like all things in life, there is a cost to be paid for using a polarizer, and that comes at the expense of light. Most polarizers eat up about two stops of light, so keep that in mind before you put one on in front of your lens. I've been using polarizers for about 30 years, and I can tell you that in practice, especially with the higher ISOs we have available on our cameras today, this really isn't a big issue for nature photographers. First off, let's look at just how to use one of these. As we mentioned, a polarizer rotates, and the reason for this is that it allows you to adjust and dial in the exact amount of polarization you want for your image. Just rotate the polarizer, and you'll see the effect right in your viewfinder. Simply turn it until you have the amount of polarization you want, and take your photo. Also, keep in mind it's pretty easy to overdo it, so sometimes I'll take several shots at different levels of polarization, and then I'll sort it all out on the computer when I get home. Now, let's look at how to use it with a few common scenarios. Okay, I almost never use a polarizer for this, preferring instead to adjust my blue skies in Photoshop. However, since this is a pretty common use for a polarizer, I do want to toss a few guidelines your way. First off, you need to realize that to get the most effect from your polarizer, you need to be at about a 90 degree angle from the sun. A quick way to determine just where your best polarization will be is simply to make a little gum with your finger and your thumb and point that right towards the sun. Now, as you rotate your arm, your thumb will point to all the best areas for polarization. This is actually one of the reasons I don't use it on skies. I'm not always pointing in the quote unquote ideal direction. Now, one area where a polarizer can really help is under a blue or sunny sky on a hazy day. It does a pretty amazing job of clearing out and cleaning up hazy landscape shots. Here's an image without the polarizer. And now here's a shot with one. That's a pretty dramatic difference if you ask me. Also, when it comes to blue skies, keep in mind that polarizers tend to work much better with lenses a little longer than 35 millimeter. Wider lenses tend to polarize unevenly, especially those times when you're not perfectly aligned with at 90 degrees from the sun, but even then, a real wide lens is gonna give you some problems. Finally, be careful not to overdo it. If you already have a nice blue sky, you can turn it almost black by overpolarizing it.
This is a situation where polarizers really shine. Most people think of them as tools for manipulating blue skies, but using them in overcast or wet or even rainy conditions is actually my number one use. The ability of a polarizer to take reflections off of vegetation and rocks is absolutely going to amaze you. I know sometimes I end up with colors that are actually so intense, I end up having to back down the saturation in post-processing. As an added bonus, if the leaves and rocks are actually wet, your polarizer can put your images off the charts. The water causes the vegetation to appear even more saturated than normal, and when your polarizer knocks off the reflection, we're just talking amazing. As a general rule, anytime I'm shooting a photo where there's vegetation, wet rocks, water, sometimes even dry rocks if they're reflected, I'm going to have a polarizer strapped to the front of my lens. Oh, and don't worry about the direction of the sun too much on overcast days. If the clouds are blocking the sun, it doesn't really make too much of a difference, but the polarizer will definitely work for you. Now, anytime I'm shooting water, I try to use a polarizer. I mean, sure, sometimes I like the reflection, and, and in fact, I just go ahead and take a pass on the polarizer, but more often than not, some degree of polarization really does help. One of my favorite uses is when shooting waterfalls. I can't remember actually the last time I photographed a waterfall without a polarizer attached to the front of the lens. It's just pretty much standard equipment for that type of scenario. It allows me to control the amount of reflection coming off the rocks and the leaves, and by dialing it in, I can also manipulate how much of what's visible underwater. This is one of those times I'll take mobile shots at different levels of polarization, and then either choose them at in post-processing or blend them together even in Photoshop to get just the right amount for every area. If you ever have the opportunity to photograph a rainbow, make sure you strap on a polarizer first. By rotating the polarizer, you can really actually enhance the rainbow. Just be careful. At some rotations, it will completely remove the rainbow, and at others, it will really make it look more intense. Now, let's look at a few random polarizer tips. One, if there's no sky in the photo, feel free to use your polarizer on a wide lens. Now, I know earlier I had mentioned that polarizers work best on focal lengths longer than 35 millimeter on a full frame camera when used with the sky. However, if there's no sky in the photo and you're using it to take off reflections, you can use it with pretty much any wide lens you want. I use mine at 14 millimeter all the time with great results. Two, for wide lenses, think about a thin polarizer. A polarizer is a pretty thick filter, and when you combine that with a wide lens, sometimes you can get a little corner vignetting. If you find it's an issue with your wide lenses, consider purchasing a thin polarizer. While it's a little bit more expensive, the thinner profile will usually help with the vignetting. Three, polarizers and panoramas don't mix. In general, avoid using a polarizer when you're shooting a panorama shot, especially if you have some sky in the photo. It'll end up as a blue blotchy mess. Four, polarizers can help with exposure. One last tip, if you have reflective highlights blowing out parts of your image, a polarizer can often get rid of the reflection and help balance out your exposure. Now, if you're ready to buy, you may be asking yourself, which one is best? This usually comes as a surprise to a lot of people, uh, but I generally just go for Nikon polarizers. They really do a great job, and I've been happy with them. However, most higher-end polarizers are really going to fall into that great job category. Uh, fillers like Hoya, B&W, uh, Singray, they're all great. Uh, my advice is to head to a site with reviews and see what your fellow photographers think. In general, a good filter should cost between $100 and $200. Uh, just check the back of your lens cap to get the correct filter size. One thing to watch out though, and it's really not as big a deal as it was a few years ago, is to make sure you get a circular polarizer or CPL. By the way, circular doesn't actually describe the shape, but rather the method used to achieve polarization. Older style linear polarizers will wreak havoc with modern metering and autofocus systems, so make sure you go CPL. Whew, that was way longer than I had anticipated, but there's really a lot of tricks and techniques to know when you're using a polarizer. If you don't have one in your bag, I'd highly recommend fixing that situation ASAP. I use mine on a very regular basis, and it's one of my favorite ways to get rich color and keep those distracting reflections away. Hey, thanks so much for watching today. If you enjoyed this content, please go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel and make sure you check out my email newsletter. Sometimes I actually put written tips on the site and I don't want you to miss those either. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to my email newsletter, and uh, thanks so much for watching. Make sure you tell your friends. Have a great day.